This is Kat Weiss's garden in Livermore. So Kat, um, as she said, to avoid shocking the neighbors, up until now, Kat has chosen a Zen-like approach to transforming her garden. Over the last six years, she's been removing the non-natives little by little and replacing them with our own local keystone species, which provide the best habitat for our winged friends. Newly installed native plants that are of the greatest value to wildlife include blue and coast live oaks, a variety of manzanitas, California lilacs, currants, sages, and buckwheats. But this last year, though Kat has uh, operated with the Zen-like approach, she seems to have lost some of her peaceful Zen-like mojo because uh, a number of the large uh, non-native ornamentals have been removed from this garden and uh, replaced by newly planted natives. This video was made in March before many of the plants were in flower, but Kat has included photos of the plants when they will be blossoming so you can see what the garden will look like over the course of the year. Uh, let us go now and look at Kat's video. Hello, welcome to my garden. My name is Kat Weiss and I operate Kat Weiss Landscape Design. This is our home in Livermore, California. We've been here six years now and it was an existing landscape of the pepper trees you see beyond you, uh, a field of jasmine and a host of other non-native plants that were in various stages of maturity. So over the years, I have been whittling away at transitioning this landscape to a California native landscape. So I'm gonna take you on a tour. Here's our lovely deer grass, as if you were visiting yourself. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the challenges and the design issues. Uh, one of the challenges that we'll see in the front yard, well, I'll see in the front yard, is the evidence of gophers. And they have really changed the landscape here. And I have planted a lot of plants that have died by gopher death. So I am now planting in gopher cages, uh, but it means that a lot of the natives in the front are also babies. So what we did in the front after ripping out the, uh, there was a fake lawn here, is we brought in some earth from back in the backyard and created a mound. I also brought, it, brought in a lot of Calistoga boulders here that you can see frame these lovely little lupin, which are of course here and then gone. Um, and then they're supported by a sticky monkey, which it's a little too early to see that one in full regalia. A um, little too early for the Grindelia stricta, the gum plant, which is um, quite native to this area. There is a prostrate form, which doesn't go quite as bonkers as the native species does. And this is a celestial sage that in about a month or so will probably wake up. So I've been trying manzanitas. I've been trying sea cliff buckwheats and California fuchsias. And on this day in mid-April, after a lovely little rain, are still well asleep. Over here, this is my beach area where I've used the 3 8 decomposed granite, not to be confused with the bluestone crushed stone or the ginger fines, uh, both of which are fine options for uh, using for ground cover. And this is the one up size from California gold fines. And I like it because it really does look like granite and it doesn't sink in as much as the California gold finds do. And we've got some fescues in here. I've got some yarrows. There's some penstemons. These are ocean pearl boulders, which are absolutely gorgeous. They've got a very silvery hue to them. We also have a garbage truck. Let's pause. The mound that you see before you, that's covered with black sage, Brandigi sage, pineapple sage, 
David's Choice Artemisia, Pacific Mist Manzanita, was formed when we dug a pool. I know, don't hate me, my kids wanted it and it's awesome. We also recycled all of this Three River Stone from uh, a previous pond in the back and built a wall. And up here in this front meadow, we've got the Baccarus Pilularis Pigeon Point. There's a little white sage. Here's my little baby blue oak. We also have blue grama grass, Budalua gracilis. And this stone edge you see here is Calistoga. It comes out of Napa Calistoga. This is called single head and it stretches up into double head size, as you can imagine, the size of your head. And it's a good size for holding back gravel, making a little edge, delineating areas. Uh, and it's gorgeous too, because it's got the gray tones and the warm tones. Here's an emerald carpet manzanita. And this is my prized baby oak that is a little challenging to see on video, I know, but he's up to about eight feet tall. And we ripped out a pistache tree this year to give him room. He was an acorn drop. Uh, the pistache, uh, as you know, has wonderful fall color, but it's just not feeding anybody. So I opted for the oak instead. Buckwheats do really well here in Livermore. That is a California buckwheat with all of its blossoms cut off and has yet to come back into flower. So I think uh, as long as the gophers don't con 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 keep attacking, things should grow nicely. I've got heat, I've got drip irrigation, I've got gopher baskets. This is a, one of the California fuchsias that has spread, but it's contained in this area and I'm just gonna let it spread, do its thing. And here's a sentinel manzanita, just finished flowering. Got its little baby apples going. This is my newest bed where I'm trying out some things that I got from Pete Bayou at East Bay Wilds. Got a little golden fleece, little baby. And a globe mallow, which has this gorgeous orangey color to its flowers. And we've got a seaside daisy, which obviously unflowering doesn't look like much. I love using pots and natives do really well in pots often. Here is the magnificent Dudleya pulverulenta in all of its pre-flowering glory. Little baby oak in a pot. Hi, friend. And uh, got a little St. Catherine's Lace buckwheat here in a pot also. And this was an, a seedling from a friend's garden, which she gifted me. And he's pretty happy right here. These are succulents in this nifty Corten pot that I got at Wayfair, if anyone's interested. And here's my view, as if you were here with me. It's my little uh, Niger seed for the birds. Oh, also fun. I don't wanna make you dizzy, but I have two lanterns here. These are like my finch condos and the finches have been building away. Then we're gonna walk down the path here. The back of the mound where I recycled some sod from a project. This is a native mo-free sod. It's a blend of three different fescues. And there were just a bunch of triangular weird chunks. So I plopped it here and it looks fabulous. It's bordering my path. Also recycled from other tear outs some new babies over here. These vegetable 
bins, boxes, flower boxes, were faced with this wonderful product called Out Deco Panel. It's recycled compressed eucalyptus made in Australia. And you can use it as a screen. You can use it like I did. All sorts of wonderful things that you can do. And here's just about the single thing that's in full glory. Mid-March Mid here. here. This lovely Ceanothus. I am trying out mountain mahogany. I've got some evergreen currants. I've got Lenitra hispidula, the honeysuckle, native honeysuckle. Here's John Dorley manzanita, which is one of my absolute favorites. It has super beautiful four season interest, flowers, red edges, just lovely. Howard McMinn just passing and Physocarpus capitatus, the nine bark. He's little because the birds, I'm sorry, not the birds, but the deer keep munching away, but I'm determined. So he's just pruned by nature. And then we walk down the path here past our manzanita. We've got some baby ribes in this bed. This is also a very shady area. So I've got some Western Columbine. I've got your babuina, which is really lovely. And there's some Frigaria chiloensis in here, beech strawberry. Uh, we've also got Diamond Heights Ceanothus coming out of a wink wink pot. Heucara sanguinea. Vaccinium of autumn, still a baby, but it will be great food. Spice bush just coming in. And now we get to go into the utility area. Just like if you were here. And you could see my worm bin and my current favorite, gopher basket. I do have some redwoods here that were here when I came. So I appreciate the shade and do what I can to minimize the water use. Eucara maxima, quite lovely. And some other babies. We've got a couple of ferns in here. A couple of baby ribes. This is the compost tumbler which changed companies. I believe it's still being produced by comp the, uh, under the name Compost Tumbler. It is awesome because you can put a wheelbarrow under it when you're done spinning. Up here is some beautiful ironwork done by a blacksmith on Alameda. then I'm going to take you from another view. So these are our lovely California fuchsias, which were spectacular in late summer and fall, all the way through the fall, with scarlet tubular flowers that the hummingbirds love. They used to have uh, gray leaves, and now, early February, they look absolutely crispy fried. Well, they're not. They are just perennials that really do go all the way back down to the root zone when they've done their business. So if you kind of peel back all this dead outer stuff, you see that the California fuchsia sprouts from its rootstock. So when the last flower goes or when you feel like, oh, okay, I think it's time, you can just cut this baby all the way to the ground around now, sometime in January, early February and that's when the days start to get a little warmer and they will just bounce right back again. There we have it. All ready to go for spring. So don't be afraid. Just go ahead and cut off the dead stuff, throw it in your composter, and the California fuchsia will pop back and delight all of you, little hummingbirds and people alike.
So here's a late season sticky monkey flower, the Mimulus. And you can see that it hasn't quite peaked out with new spring broke growth, but all the dead flowers from last season are still hanging on the leaves, which often makes people think, oh, it's dying, but it's not, it's just sticky. So you can go along the leaves if you are so inclined and just kind of pull off the dead flower bits and the dried leaves from last season if you want to. But this is a task that you don't need to do because in a few weeks, this plant's gonna spring back from all these little nodes with new growth and it's gonna push out all the dead stuff. But you know, if you're looking for a task and you've got your audiobook in your head, then you can certainly go and clean up your little sticky monkeys. Welcome to the backyard. We've got our uh, wine or our seltzer in hand. And we're gonna tour the backyard here, back garden. All of this is uh, new to us. It was a, an enormous fake lawn that we blew up. And there was a fountain here that we took out and created this mound. Lavatera acerginifolia. Which was in full flower not too long ago, actually. Uh, I've had some challenges here. I'm trying meadow grasses. I do have a dog. The dog enjoys tearing through the meadow grasses. Here's a volunteer baccarus and some Penstem and Etonii. They're so fun. And behind that is uh, a Senecio, yellow and gold. Nah, that's not right. Silver and gold that I got from Pete. A Salvia pacophylla and woolly sunflower. And this fun thing is the Camasonia, the beach primrose, which has decided to reseed itself all over the place. But I don't mind, because it's not doing anybody any harm, and it's beautiful. I just pull it out where I don't like it. There's a fire pit. recycled wine barrel, put some varnish on that puppy so that it doesn't fall apart. Can watch a game in here. I mean, I'm sorry, we're gonna watch Doug Tellamy's talk in here. And here's my pride and joy, outdoor shower. I love this. This is recycled manzanita from my good friend Maggie Cutler's property, cut by permission. And if you, any of you knew Maggie, we lost Maggie this year. She was in the owner of Mines Road Natives. Her brand was Winter Creek Ranch and she produced some of the finest plants I used to use in my gardens. And I miss her terribly. So my manzanita is in honor of her. And here's the deep back garden, more Corten vegetable planters. I'll walk down the ocean pearl boulders here. It might be time to prune the collards. And out here, I have been messing around with that native Mofri sod. little beach strawberry. And this is cool. Some Areogonum arborescence, Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, reseeded themselves in the gravel of the fire pit from these plants just beyond. We've got the Areogonum latifolium, Areogonum arborescens, which the birds love to pick apart. Areogonum fasciculatum, 
California buckwheat. The buckwheats are doing really well. If I keep trying Ceanothus with variable luck between the gophers and whatever else is going on back here. Another Dudleya. One of the Dudleyas that I've had in a pot is now 16 years old, which is super cool. Here's an Anchor Bay Ceanothus that just finished flowering. And another Globe Mallow. St. Catherine's Lace. Buckwheat. And that is the prostrate form of the uh, gum plant. So he'll have yellow flowers deep into the summer, which is fun. So all that along with our California fuchsia here gives you that late season color. Here is a disc goal if you are a disc golf aficionado. And a bee's bliss sage. This one is enormous. It's about eight feet around, four feet tall. And look at that. Just in time for the end of the tour, the sun came out. Thank you for visiting. I wanted to close by showing you some photographs of some of the beautiful plants in my garden at different times of the year, other than uh, the moment when this video was taken, um, to show you that there is plenty of color and wonderful species. So enjoy. Accompanied by a bird recording that I took from the front yard. So this was before Kat did a lot of work on her garden. She took out the breath of heaven here. And uh, so she has a number of small plants in their place, but I look forward to seeing it, her garden uh, next year or later on when it's had a chance to fill in a little bit. Kat is a friend and colleague of um, many years. She's a beautiful garden designer. She works in the Livermore Tri-Valley area. You can find her contact information under Find a Designer on the Garden Tours website. Uh, she designs beautiful native plant gardens and her mother's garden will be on the tour on Sunday, May 1st. That's Carol Hardesty and Kat designed her mom's garden, of course. Um, and that garden that we just saw of Kat's, while many of the plants that we saw uh, just now were newly planted and that video was made between uh, February and March, you can tell she's gonna have a lot of color with the monkey flower, the fuchsia, the purple penstemons, the creamy buckwheats, the yellow uh, lupins, the manzanitas, the blue purple California lilac. Um, and I also wanted to uh, take my hat off to Kat because she's another one of these people that really rose to the challenge of making their own video. Kat is not a professional videographer. You may be surprised to hear she is a landscape designer, but um, 
she made a video for us this year and I know it takes a lot of time and effort to do that. So thank you, Kat, for um, taking on that task. Arinda Books has made the tour a great offer. If you buy any of these books, they'll make a contribution to the tour. These are the three Doug Tallamy books. And these California specific books are also uh, the same deal for the tour. This new one is uh, Native Plant Gardening for Birds, Bees and Butterflies is just coming out now. And then there's a California Gardening a Month by Month um, maintenance book by Helen Popper. When I was young, I would get in the car with my mom and dad. They would warm up the car before they started driving. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember it so clearly. But I learned recently that if your car is idling for more than 30 seconds, it's better to turn the car off and turn it back on again than to leave it running. So if you, if you, uh, you can save gas, save money and spare the air by turning off your car's engine if you'll be waiting more than 30 seconds. You'll be protecting your and your family's lungs, saving money on gas, and as car exhaust is the number one source of air pollution in the Bay Area, you'll be helping to keep our skies blue. If you're waiting to pick someone up from school, sports practice, or the library, if you're sitting at a drive through or a car wash, just turn your engine off. How can you help? You can learn more at idlefreebayarea.org. I have to say that since I heard this, I turn my car off all the time these days. I just don't let it idle at all if I think it's going to be like take any time. I'd like to thank uh, our stalwart major funders, the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, the Contra Costa Clean Water Program, the Contra Costa Water District, and the Clean Water Program Alameda County for their continued belief in this program and the funding that makes this tour possible. I'd like to thank the other sponsors for their support for this year's tour. And these sponsors as well. Garden tour hosts Ann Chambers and Ed McAlpin have generously offered a $500 challenge grant. If these funds can be matched with donations from viewers. If you haven't yet had the chance to contribute, please help by making a donation now. You can do so via the donations button on the tour's homepage at Bringing Back the Natives. You'll see it at the bottom. Through Venmo at Bringing Back the Natives, on the tour's GoFundMe page, or you can mail in a check. The tour's address is under Contact Us. <laughs>